we are, we're in a series. Uh, so remember, remember a few years ago, you would wear, there was a bracelet going around, W, 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 J, D, which was, what would Jesus do? And, uh, I remember it was kind of a cool bracelet, a lot of, uh, when we were, we were leading a youth group, uh, sort of during that drive, and there was, there were a lot of kids wearing these bracelets, and it was just a reminder that when you were living life, you should ask yourself this question, so in this situation that I'm in, what would Jesus do, right? And, and um, we've been looking at, if Jesus was here now, and if Jesus was looking at the Bridge Community Church specifically, but the church in general, I think we have another question to ask that goes, what would Jesus undo about who we are? There, there are a lot of things that, that we have taken on, uh, some practices that the church has uh, picked up over the years that, that maybe are less representative of what Jesus would do, and perhaps Jesus would be here saying, you should stop doing that, yeah. right? Uh, um, this is week three in that series. Uh, a couple weeks ago, Steve led us in this discussion that isn't up on the screen yet. Let us in this discussion that was uh, spiritual indifference. I, I think that Jesus would like to undo spiritual indifference in us. I also think Steve was talking about this last week, and this was a great discussion if uh, unfortunately last week the 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 uh, recording was was really bad we just had a whole um, comedy of errors with things that didn't get picked up but if you would enjoy watching an out of focus message on uh, meaningless worship you should check it out online because he it was a great talk this week we're going to talk about hypocrisy and the interesting thing is, and I don't have any, like, really data to support this, but it's my understanding that the number one reason people don't go to church or don't trust the church is because they think it's full of hypocrites, right? And how did we get to this point? You know, and if, and if you're visiting, if you're watching online, maybe, maybe that's a question you have, maybe you don't trust the church because you think it's full of hypocrites. And there are a lot of hypocrites in the church. And the interesting thing, the, the thing that I think is really, really, really interesting is that Jesus held a disdain for hypocrites the same way that you do. Jesus, the, the, the leader, the heart, the soul of the church, doesn't get more angry at anyone as much as he gets angry at hypocrites. Isn't that interesting? Last week, Steve was talking to us about meaningless worship, and he took us to a passage that, that read this way. He's talking, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Which is actually probably the best definition of hypocrisy that you can find. It's the idea that you are putting on a face, pretending to be somebody, honoring someone with your lips, but behind their backs you're just talking bad about them. Jesus got more angry at hypocrites than anyone else. And you, do you know something? Every time he gets mad at hypocrites, he is mad at religious people. So, so Jesus goes out on the streets. There's a lot of horrible things going out on the streets. Jesus didn't get as angry at, at, at how people were cheating in the marketplace or, uh, or sexual sins. He didn't get angry at people on the streets, as angry as he got at hypocrites. And all of the hypocrites that he defined and all of the hypocrites that he was speaking to were significant people in the religion of the day, which means... 
that religion somehow is extremely susceptible to hypocrisy in a way that it's not anywhere else. You know, he doesn't go up to the adulterer and say, you hypocrite. He goes up to the religious leaders, the religious people, and says, you hypocrites. And so probably more, more than any other talk that, that, that hits me hard uh, uh, is this one. I am so susceptible to hypocrisy, and we're going to talk about this. There's a reason why I am, but the biggest reason that I am is because I grew up in a religious culture. And for me, and for you, who grew up the same way, this is one thing that probably more than anything else in your life that Jesus wants you to be aware of and on guard of is hypocrisy. How does hypocrisy happen? What actually is hypocrisy? And sometimes we kind of get mixed up with the definition. We kind of think, you know, you'll beat yourself up. You know, I claim to be a Christian and here I am doing this thing whatever that thing is, and you, you kind of go, I'm, I'm a hypocrite because I claim to be a Christian, and there I am, water skiing on Sunday, <laughs> or whatever it is, right? <laughs> Hypocrisy is not the disparity between what we do and what we wish we did. Hypocrisy is not being imperfect. Hypocrisy is not falling or, or, or whatever it is. Hypocrisy is not missing the mark, even though you want to hit the mark. What hypocrisy is, it's the gap between what we show and who we are. Hypocrisy is the difference between the persona we project and the heart that was, is within us. Uh, th that is what hypocrisy is. And within religious circles, it is such a deep breeding ground for that because, uh, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but it's because of expectations we place on ourselves and other people. Hypocrisy is the gap between what we show and who we are. It's what we say and how we live. When we look at the actual a uh, Greek word that gets used is Jesus is shouting, <laughs> and he is shouting, at the hypocrites. Uh, out, of, out of the just more than 20 occasions where the word hypocrite or hypocrisy shows up in the Bible, it's always directed at religious people like you and me. So we need to pay attention to this. And when he's talking about hypocrisy, he's using this word. And it is... Uh, hupo rik trace, taste. Hupo rik taste. You like my Greek this morning? <laughs> I even tried to throw in an Italian accent with it that time. <laughs> but it's being an actor, a stage player, one who hides behind a mask. Have you ever heard the term church face? Right? We, we can slide on this church face. It's the face that you put on as you walk in the door after you've just yelled at your kids for making you late. All right? That's the old church face. How's it going? It's wonderful. I'm so glad to be here. It's so great to see you. <laughs> yes, yes, my face is flushed, but it's because I'm so happy. All right? <laughs> we, we put on this act. We become hypocrites because that is exactly what Jesus is talking about when you act like someone you aren't. When you act like someone you aren't. Have you ever heard the term, fake it till you make it? Right? And I got to be careful where I go here because we're, 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 I'm talking about a complex issue in simple terms. But Jesus never says, fake it till you make it. Jesus doesn't say, make sure you have the club code that they play at church in order to be a follower of me. I, I, I love 
what Jesus has to say because Jesus doesn't pull any punches and he makes it very clear what his intent for you is and the thing that he despises. As he's talking, if you look in, uh, in Matthew chapter 23, he, he goes into a big conversation about this. And partway through the chapter, I think, it's, I think it's verse 13, there's a section called the seven woes. And the seven woes are all directed at the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious leaders of the day. But as he is describing this, he's talking to his disciples, and, he's, and, and I read it as though he's saying, okay, when the church starts after I ascend, when you start planting churches, don't be like the current religious leaders. Don't, don't let people call you rabbi because I'm the teacher. I am the rabbi. You know, you're just my servants. And as he is describing what he desires for the, the religious um, gatherings that will be called churches within Christianity, he says to his disciples, okay, when you look at the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, you should listen to what they say, but don't do what they do, because he says, everything they do is for people to see. He says, when they give, they make sure that everybody knows that they're giving, and they'll bring in their treasure, and they'll blast trumpets so that everybody can see, wow, look at how generous they are. And when they are praying or when they are devote to whatever they're doing, they'll wear their phylacteries, which um, we talked about back in the summer. But it's, it's, a religious, it's a religious thing about putting the word of God on your mind. And they would make sure that everybody knows that they are extremely religious, that they are focused on God. Because when you do it, you make them really big so everybody can see. Everything they do in a religious context is for the benefit of them and people seeing them and admiring how good they are at what they do. And Jesus, as you follow through this passage, he goes, I hate that. I despise that. He says, you know, the idea of being devoted I like that. But pretending you're devoted so that you get honor from someone else, I hate that. When you are doing what you're doing in order that other people can see you doing it, Jesus is very clear about what he thinks of that. And so he goes into this, into this whole seven woes. And in verse 15, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! <laughs> With an exclamation mark, so you know he was yelling. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you succeed, you make them twice as much the child of hell as you are. <laughs> Ouch. I don't think that was like the the tag they used when they were calling disciples, come, be a child of hell, right? Like, but Jesus' observation of what they were doing is akin to, <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this, Satan worship, right? What they were doing was honoring evil, honoring Satan. It was playing into Satan's plan. And what were they doing? They were, they were bringing people into the religious practices and they were, they were promoting the idea of living not a bad life, but not with any core significance, not with honoring God. It's all about honoring themselves and using the things that honor God to honor themselves. Jesus pulls no punches on this. He says, Woe to you, in verse 23, teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spice, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. See, Jesus, if you continue to read on to this, Jesus, Jesus says, you should, have, you should have, like, giving a tenth is a good thing. You should have done that, but 
not forsaken this whole justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Now, I've been reading through uh, the Old Testament. Um, a lot of people here have been reading through the Bible over the year. I encourage you to, to get into that. I was later to the gate. I started uh, at Easter. A lot of people started in January. But as I've been reading through the Old Testament, I've been reading about the nation of Israel, and I've been reading about good kings, and I've been reading about bad kings, and I've been reading about God's blessing, and I've been reading about when the nation falls away from God. And there is an absolute trend. And, and, and what happens is as people tend to move away from God, they tend to it's not typical that they forget the religious practices, it's just that they add other things on. And they begin to worship other idols. And instead of trusting God, they, they begin to make treaties with foreign countries in order to have protection, rather than trusting God to protect them. And the symptom of that is always the same thing. God will come to them, and they will be judged, and he will, his observation will be, that they have forgotten justice and they're oppressing the poor. And that's, that's not the actual cause of their sin, that's the symptom of their sin. And so as Jesus is talking to the religious leaders, he's saying, you give a tenth, you do all of that, but you forget about the poor, you oppress the poor, you forget about justice, you forget about being faithful, not just to God, but to one another. You start to shut people down who see things differently than you. You, you begin to focus not on God who leads you to serve people. You begin to focus on yourself and begin to serve yourself as well. And the symptom is always the same. The symptom is always the same. It's always that people among you are oppressed and you don't give a rip. When you are walking away from God, you will begin to be more concerned about your bank account than you are about the people around you and their needs. And it's always the same. And I find myself on that slide occasionally as I'm sure you do too. And it's a symptom. It's a symptom of where your heart is at. And the answer is not just simply treating the symptom and going out and serving the poor, although God can work with you through that, but that's not the solution. You don't just focus on the poor. You focus on God who leads you to service of those who are oppressed. And that's what Jesus says to the teachers of the law. He says, yeah, it's good that you tithe. It's good that you do all of those religious practices. But if you are doing them with the right heart, then that will lead you into justice and mercy and faithfulness. You won't write off your friends who see things differently than you. Huh. Jesus uses some really strong language here, and I want... <laughs> He says, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Do you know what he said to the adulterers? He said, go and sin no more. <laughs> this is what he says to the religious leaders, the hypocrites. How do you think you will escape hell? See, here's the thing. And, and I put this in quotes. I stole this line from Craig Rochelle, so I don't want to sound like a hypocrite, but I'm owning up. He says, Jesus wasn't calling out the sin. And I put sin in brackets because he was calling out sin, but not sin in sort of the, the typical sense. He wasn't calling them out because he didn't say, go serve the poor. He didn't say, go work on justice, go do those things. He wasn't calling out the sin what Jesus was calling out was the shill. He was calling out the mask, the thing that they were wearing, pretending to be somebody that they really weren't, pretending to be devoted followers of God when really they were just looking at serving themselves. Hmm. 
I sometimes <laughs> uh, I sometimes really struggle with some of the teachings that are out there that teach devotion and giving in order that you will receive and get, right? And I so often think, doesn't that sound hypocritical? See, we don't serve God so we can get. We serve God because we've gotten already. See, God has given us an opportunity to have an eternal life with him. What else do you want? Oh, I want more. I want, I want, I want blessings, right? And, and, it, and God will bless you. But this life is not about you serving you through religion. This life is about you discovering a God who is willing to give his life for you and serving him with everything you have. And then he cares for every one of your needs. Jesus had zero tolerance for hypocrisy. The language that he uses, he doesn't say, but that's okay. He says, how are you going to escape hell if you continue to live this way? But it isn't that he is without hope because he has unlimited grace for sinners in need of forgiveness. He has zero tolerance for hypocrisy, but he has unlimited grace for a sinner in need of forgiveness. And even as he is talking to these hypocrites, these Pharisees, these people that are like you and me, the susceptibilities that we have, he is saying to them, Woe to you, teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. <laughs> I, I love this symbolism that, that Jesus gives. It's like... Uh, Claude, you want some coffee? <laughs> and, and Claude goes, didn't you just drink out of that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is my hunting camp cup. I haven't washed this for like two weeks, right? <laughs> you want some coffee? Well, what's on the inside? Why are you so worried about the inside, Claude? Look at it. It's a Joy Bible Camp mug. <laughs> you can't get a more religious mug than this. <laughs> I should have had graphite, but I don't have a graphite mug. <laughs> I mean, come on. And we all know that, like, that's gross. <laughs> My hunting camp mug is gross. I, I admit to that. This isn't actually it. I wouldn't do that to a joy camp mug. But the reality is, <laughs> hasn't social media kind of led us to look at my mug? Because it's just a picture of the outside of us. And I think we live in a world right now where we are really susceptible to hypocrisy simply because of the platforms that are available to us. The platforms themselves aren't evil. Religious systems in themselves aren't evil. It's hypocrisy within them that is. And the idea that you take a picture, <laughs> you can even do this with if you're trying to, to impress the religious people among you, you can take a picture of your coffee and your Bible and make it look like this is what you do every morning in complete serenity. And some people do. But it's just a picture of a moment. It's not about the life itself. I mean, we need to be careful. But Jesus... Jesus goes beyond that. He says, uh, but on the inside, you're full of greed and self-indulgence. And then he offers them this. He says, you blind Pharisees, just first clean the inside of the cup or the dish, and then the outside will be clean. Just, just forget about the outside. Just forget about those picture moments. Just forget about living your life to impress somebody else. Just forget about the outside of the cup or the dish. And if you focus on the inside, don't worry, the outside will look clean as well. It will be an honest clean. It requires so much less anxiety about people actually finding out what's on the inside. All right? 
There's a proverb in the Old Testament that goes like this. He says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. See, Satan knows something um, that we probably all know at our core, but there's a tool that Satan loves to use. And if Satan can get you living a life of fear of people finding out, he has you captive. If you are living a life where, where uh, you know, you're just, it's this dirty little secret that's in the, in the background, that's just kind of who you are, Satan takes a hold of that dirty little secret and it grows into a dirty big secret and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And that's how we decay from the inside. It's the little, it's the little things that start. It's just a dirty little secret. Uh, we all have them, right? We probably all do. But it's allowing Satan to take those dirty little secrets and he just loves to water them. He controls your life. He gets people, he gets you thinking, well, what if people find out? Or I think she knows. And it begins to destroy your life. Satan loves to work in the darkness. Satan loves to work in the secret places. And that's Satan's battleground. Here's the truth. If you have nothing to fear when you have nothing to hide. You know, so often, we think that we need to put on this perfect persona, but what we forget is nobody's perfect. And we try to hide the things that make us imperfect. And we're all susceptible to that. And again, especially in a religious culture. But that's not the place that God wants us to be. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. And there's no freedom when we're trying to hide our imperfections. But when we have nothing, we have nothing to hide, we will have nothing to fear. And it's being living an honest life, not putting on the Hippocratic, <laughs> Hippocratic, <laughs> Hippocritic. I got medical for a second there. <laughs> it's about putting on that hypocritic face that acting face, the thing that closes around you, creates darkness within you that Satan loves to play in. So the question is, why are we so susceptible to hypocrisy? You know, and I've been thinking about this. Um, uh, years, years ago, um, Years ago, when Jen and I moved back to the area, I just finished college, we were leading a youth group with uh, Alicia's parents. And I remember a discussion we had about, you know, some of these kids are just so sneaky, right? Some of these kids in our youth group, they're, they're just being so sneaky. And, and a friend of ours who had moved into the area at the same time said, of course they're sneaky. They're not allowed to do anything. <laughs> right? And you go, well, yeah, I guess you're, you're right. Like, and it was in that, that sneaky place that their lives actually got out of control. It's in that darkness where they're not allowed to be honest, where God loves to work. And, and, and the thing about Christianity and and. and Christianity, Christendom, the thing about the church is that especially in the past when you uh, started going to a church you, you started to have to take on the convictions of everyone else around you. I, I, when I grew up going to a church we had this unwritten dress code. Like I would never have been able to be on stage in jeans. And, and I, I mean, that's just a simple thing, but it's, it's, it's the way that we assume or we take on the convictions of everyone else that causes problems because I can't live up to your convictions. You know, whether it's alcohol, whether it's dancing, whether it's whatever it is. I, see, I wasn't allowed to go to high school dances. And if you ever go to a wedding where I am, where there's a dance floor, 
you will know. <laughs> I need dance lessons. But the thing is, I don't think my parents were against dancing. I think my parents were against offending other people who they thought were against dancing. And there's a whole cultural ripple effect that happens within the church, within this context. And, and let me say to you, as loudly as I can, Jesus hates that. He has a term for it. It's called hypocrisy. Because we put on a face pretending to be someone we're not to impress someone else that is probably doing the same thing. And within the church, we create an extremely uh, fertile land for hypocrisy because it's assumed that you should live up to my convictions and I should live up to yours. And Paul actually addresses that whole idea, and it's a very complex idea, and probably no other time in my history has it been more complicated than during the pandemic and people's views of the government. Because everybody here has an opinion. And in, and in the early days, I was pretty strong with my opinion, and I've really worked at pulling it back. My opinion really hasn't changed. I just hope you hear less of it. Because I think those are things that divide. And I think those are things that, that breed hypocrisy. But Jesus addresses this. Uh, if we read a little, uh, a little further, it's um, actually this is Romans 14. It says Matthew 23, but Romans 14. Except the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling or dispute over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything. And this is Paul talking in the context of meat sacrificed to idols. And there's a very strong instruction about this in Acts. But Paul is talking to this group, and he says, <laughs> one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. So I, I had to clarify that in case there's a vegetarian or vegan in the group. It's okay, it's not about weak faith. It's about meat sacrificed to idols is what he's talking about here. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. I love how Paul puts this. Go stop judging over these silly things because this is not about focusing on Christ, which is what the church is supposed to do. must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. And who are you to judge someone else's servant? <laughs> who are you to judge someone else's convictions about whether you can water ski on Sunday? Who are you to judge someone else's convictions about whether they abstain from alcohol? Or they don't. Who are you? You're simply a servant of the master who the other person is a servant of as well. And we don't have time for this because it will destroy the church. And that's why Jesus confronts hypocrisy head on louder than he confronts any other issue. Stop being hypocrites. Goes one person considers one day more sacred than the other, another considers every day alike. Okay, each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. If you feel strongly about something, if you feel strongly about something, you believe that you are convicted by God, make sure that you are, and then apply it to you. Right. Yeah. And be okay with people who see it differently. Because whether you eat meat or don't eat meat doesn't determine whether you are a better follower of Christ. Oh, I want to crack jokes, but it's too important. <laughs> Let us therefore make every effort to, lead, uh, to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Is how Jesus keeps going. And then, not Jesus, this is how Paul keeps going. 
And then just to make things a little more complex, and, don't say, and, and, and say, you know, Paul goes, okay, you've heard all this, now it's not that simple. Because he ends by saying this, it is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. So in this living by your convictions, you are to be considerate of other people's convictions and you aren't to be offensive in your behavior, but somehow we took that to, I have to live up to everyone else's convictions. And it's in somewhere in between from ignoring other people's convictions to living by other people's convictions, and it's somewhere in the middle that we live where we want to walk in peace. And you don't have to hunt or eat meat to be my friend. Because we are all followers of Christ. <laughs> and if my eating meat is offensive to you, I don't have to eat it in your presence. But we still need to get together. And I think that it's somewhere in there that we need to understand what God calls us to. So often, if you look at the, the life cycle of a church, the life cycle of a church is always seems to be it will go off strong and it will be focused on Christ and there will be unity and we have forgiveness and grace for each other and we're excited about what's happening and then all of a sudden something will happen. Often it's politics. Sometimes it's gender issues. Sometimes it's, it's something that, that will divide us, usually on a 50-50 split. And Satan will convince us somehow that we need to live up to other people's values, expectations, convictions. When Jesus is extremely strong in saying, just get along. You be you. <laughs> In fact, this is how Paul sums it up. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Whatever you believe about these things, stop sh shouting that everybody else has to see it your way. If I have learned one important lesson about the body of Christ through the pandemic is this. You don't need to see it the same way I do. And we are still followers of Christ. And I could be wrong. And you could be wrong. In fact, everybody could be wrong. But we can't be wrong about our relationship with Christ. And you don't need to see it the same way as I do. In fact, boy, if this was a room full of people who saw everything the same way as I do, that would be a scary place. Because I need opposition to my views to keep me walking toward Christ because I am imperfect. I need you to become who I'm supposed to be. And you need me too. And this is what God calls us into. And I'm pretty sure that if Jesus was here and if he could undo one thing that lives in every church and including the bridge, he would say to us, you hypocrites, take off the mask. I'm just going to call on Jen. In our masked world, how do we do this? What are some thoughts on this extremely sobering issue? So many people that I've personally talked to, this is what keeps them from a living God in their life, is us. Man, that's so sobering to me. What are we doing to block people from truly knowing an authentic God. So how do we unmask? How do we unmask? Tim. Oh, man, you are a killjoy. <laughs> Praying blessing on the person who irritates you. Oof. That's good. Playing, praying blessing on the person that irritates you, because we all got them. 
that we've all got people that just and I love what Kev said about um, how that actually grows us we're so scared of opposition some of us more than others some of us kind of dig it but more for the drama than anything but um, why do we fear opposition why They might be right, we, that, which means we might be wrong. Why else do we fear opposition? People won't like us. People won't like us. Oy, we have to change. But what is the core of all the things that have just been said? What is at the core? Pride, Pride. self, right? Ego insecurity me 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 really when we really pair it all back and all down all of those answers go back to a me-centered world which i always think faith is absolutely a challenge on that because it's not about us and could everything change in the hypocrisy world if we transferred our center to Christ? Could everything change? Could we really authentically live our lives, be unmasked, be real, if that was our center and not ourselves? It's unburdened. It's, unburdened. it's like, I mean, when Jesus says, um, bring me your burdens. He's saying, I want you to be free. And if we could really, really get this, we could be unburdened and we could be free. Free of what people think, free of what this looks like, what that looks like. But in our Christ centeredness, we will look at our motives. We will analyze, wow, why is this really getting me? Why is this person really bugging me, right? We will look deeper and not at the surface, which really so much, so much conflict and division is just seeing that surface and not looking underneath. 